Hey everyone, Willsy here from Willsy360. Welcome back to the second part of my video series about how to develop a 360 degree photo. In this video, I'm going to give you an in-depth view of how I store my photos on the hard drive and structure the folders throughout my development process. I will also take you through step-by-step step exactly how I post-process each individual photo in Camera Raw to prepare for the 360 degree photo. And lastly, I will take each of the individually post-processed images, transfer them into ICE, and stitch them together into a final 360 degree photo. So without further ado, let's get stuck into it. To start off with guys, I just want to show you uh, how I structure my folders. The most important thing here is just ensuring you've got three segregated buckets for the individual phases for this workflow. Moving down to the folder tree, you'll notice I basically import the entire panorama folder as it's saved to the SS, uh, sorry, the SD card from the drone. So I put import this in, and what I do is I just keep these folders here um, exactly as they're numbered. Um, others might have preferences to name them, but I find just leaving it as is. But what I do uh, is I create two subfolders under the 360 photo that I'm intending on developing. Moving up to the thumbnails view, you can see here I've got a 360 degree or 360 final folder. I've got a 360 parts folder and see raw settings. Now this one I'm not too concerned about. This is just one I've dumped here for the purpose of the video. So really this top folder is the images that came directly from the drone. So you'll see these here are DNGs. As I mentioned earlier, they are, I take the photos in raw format to get the most detail out of the photos. Once I've uh, post-processed all of the individual raw photos in Camera Raw, I export them straight into the 360 parts folder. This is my bucket for the photos, uh, the individual parts of the 360 that are post-processed. From this folder here, I then develop the images in ICE or Image Composite Editor, generate the 360 degree photo and export it into the 360 final folder where I will further develop it in Photoshop. Now that we've got the mundane folder management guff out of the way, let's move on to the more fun stuff and jump right into Camera Raw and start developing these photos for the 360 image. Camera Raw is where we get to start squeezing some life out of the photos. If you're familiar with editing photos in Lightroom, Photoshop or Camera Raw, this part of the process is very similar. Here you will adjust brightness, contrast, colouring, shadows and so forth. Then replicate the modifications to the rest of the photos in the 360 sequence. Let's get into it. Start by navigating back to the folder where your 360 photos are located. I take the raw images that I got from the drone and I select all of them. I then drag those photos over the Photoshop icon and drop it. Camera Raw opens up with all of your photos on the left hand column. One thing you'll notice too is how dark these photos are. There's a reason why I take these photos so dark and it's because I want to achieve the most high dynamic range from a single photo. It's easier and more efficient to capture a individual photo then underexpose it in order to capture the overexposed areas such as the sky and then draw back the detail from the shadows. Instead of taking three different exposures, merging those into a single HDR and then taking it into Camera Raw to edit. To give you a quick overview of how much detail you can pull out of an underexposed raw image, here's some examples of some before and after comparisons. So if we look at this first photo, this, what you're seeing now is the before photo, and then after post-processing, this is the amount of detail you can pull from the photo. Moving on to another photo, in the second example you can see there's virtually no detail in the rock itself, however after post-processing, a large amount of detail can be pulled out of the rock, with virtually no damage to the sky. In a third example of a ground shot, you can see you can barely make out the details in the rocks, but after post-processing, the detail that you can pull out of the ground is astounding. Let's move on to my workflow in Camera Raw. 
To start with, I want to explain one of the benefits of Mavic Air's 360 degree panorama feature. One thing that's great about it is it takes photos in exactly the same angles every time. So there's a pattern to the way the photos are taken, which is easy to recognize in Camera Raw or any photography software for that matter. What I mean by this is for the Mavic Air to take a full 360 degree photo, it has to take eight degrees of photos. And in each of those eight degrees, the Mavic Air takes three photos. One photo is taken up at the sky. The second photo is then taken at the horizon line, as you can see here. The third photo then aimed down on an angle at the ground. And one single photo is taken directly below it. This pattern is then repeated by the Mavic Air in its full 360 degree cycle. So you can pick this pattern up through Camera Raw and it makes for very quick editing because you only need to edit three photos essentially. What you do is once you've edited the first three photos within Camera Raw, you can then sync those edits to similar photos in the pattern. So it means you don't have to edit each photo individually, you just do the first three and repeats throughout your full 360 cycle. Let's get stuck into how this is done right now. Starting with the first photo, let's bring the details out of these shadows and give it a bit more spice. I'm going to blaze through all the adjustments because they are very subjective. Something that works for my photos may not necessarily work for your photos. Okay, so that's about where I want it for the colors and contrast, but we're just going to step over to the Tone Curves tab, and I'm going to make some changes here as well. And because the exposure in these images is quite dark, I'll often go to the Detail tab and bring up the noise reduction a little bit to about 50% on the luminance, and I'll do it about 100% on the detail. This just smoothens out the image a little bit and uh, helps remove the noise in the dark areas. Now that we've done the first photo at the horizon line, let's move on to the next photo. We're looking up at the sky now, so we're going to repeat the same actions as the first photo, but we're going to tailor each setting to the photo itself. Most settings will often be the same, but occasionally, because there's more highlights or more darks, a little bit of special treatment is required for each photo. Now it goes without saying that these settings may not work for your images. The best thing is to go through each setting one by one and just get a feel for what looks good for your image. And that about does it for image number two. So we'll move on to image number three, which is looking down about 45 degrees to the ground. Again, same process here. We're going to repeat much of the same settings with some minute adjustments tailored to this specific image. Moving over to the tone curves. And there we go. Now that we have the first three images edited to our liking, let's move on to syncing these images with similar images in the 360 degree pattern. So we'll start with the horizon photo. Let's select the first image. It's important to note that you select the image you want to use as the source first. Then scroll down, find similar images that are at the same horizon line as the source image. And we're going to hold down the control button and left click those images. So for example this one and I can see that the horizon line's about the same level in this one so we'll grab that one too and again with this one here horizon line you can tell by the thumbnail but you can decide to click the image you just need to restart your selection and this one and this one and that one. So in total you should have about seven images selected. Right click on any one of them and click sync settings. A window will pop up asking you for the types of adjustments that you'd like to sync to the other photos. I select all apart from crop, spot removal and local adjustments. Once selected, click OK. Now you can see here on the left that each one of these photos that we selected has now acquired the same adjustments as the first source image. And because the angle of the photo is exactly the same as the source photo, the adjustments are almost perfect for these images. In some occasions, you may come across scenarios where the synchronized adjustments don't work, and that's fine. You will get instances where there's a brighter sky or something bright in the foreground. You'll have to just adjust those accordingly, but for the most part, the setting should match. Now let's return to the top, and we'll repeat the same process for the second image. 
So the second image is predominantly looking at the sky, so we're going to now focus on all images similar that are looking at the sky. Again, selecting the source image first, scrolling down, we'll select this one, this one as well, these two, these two, and this last one. And again, we're going to right click, sync settings, click OK, and now our settings are copied. Again, we'll return to the top, select the final of the three images, which is predominantly looking at the ground, choose this as our source, and we're going to do the same again. We'll select both the ground images at the start, those two, both of these, these two, and that about does it. Once again, right click, sync settings, and OK to continue. And now all of our photos are done. What I tend to do when I've post-processed all the images with a first pass, I'll then return to the top and go through each photo individually just to fine tune and check all the settings are good. And as I complete the final optimizations of each photo, I'll mark them five stars to indicate to myself that I've completed that photo and it's now ready to be exported. In this instance, I'm happy with the outcome of all the photos, so I'm just gonna mark them five stars. I'm doing this quickly for the purposes of the video, but the reason I do this is because when I'm editing a 360 degree photo, I often move back and forth at random between most of my photos when making my final adjustments. So this is a helpful way of identifying what needs adjustments still and what has been completed. Now, another tip that you might find very helpful, unlike Lightroom, where your image adjustments are automatically saved in a database file, not to the file itself on the hard drive, your adjustments will go missing if you don't click the done button here. So everything I've done in Camera Raw up until now has not been saved. I have to click the done button, exit out of Camera Raw for all these adjustments to save to the image's metadata. The one huge benefit to this is that the photos hold these non-destructible adjustments, not a database. So you could move the photo after editing it in Camera Raw to another hard drive with Camera Raw, open up the photo and these adjustments can be restored. So that's the wonderful thing about editing with metadata as opposed to a database. With Lightroom, if you move the photo, you've adjusted it, you have to export it. Those adjustments aren't actually stored in the photo, they're burnt into the photo. One handy wee tip to avoid you losing your adjustments after you've reached your final optimization, I select each photo and I come over to this tab over here, Snapshots, and you'll see here I've got a defaults setting as I hold my mouse over it, it takes it back to the default settings. And then I've also got my settings. And these are the settings that I just had. So how I do this is once I've reached the final adjustments of my photo, I come into the snapshots tab. I come down to here, new snapshot, type a name. And there you have it. All your adjustments from this tab, all these tabs for that matter, are saved. But just an important reminder, you need to click done before these will save. If you do not click done, all these snapshots, everything you've done in this one session will disappear. So it's very important before you move forward or do anything else to your photos, once you've got them in your final adjustment stage, click done and then reopen Camera Raw with these same photos. Very important to do that. Another thing to note is that if you make further adjustments to a photo, even after you've made a snapshot, say for example, oh, I want to bump up the exposure on this photo, and now I've adjusted this image. So one thing I want to do is just update the snapshot. I'll go to the snapshot menu. I'll right click on my settings snapshot, update with current settings. And that now updates this my settings profile. Let's click done to ensure these images are updated. With all of your 360 photos now adjusted to your liking, we can now export them into the 360 parts folder. So I'm going to select all by holding down shift and we're going to go save images. I'll make sure that the correct folder is selected. I leave the document name the same and I select TIFF format because we don't need a full blown PSD file. We just need an uncompressed TIFF and click save. You'll notice down on the bottom left corner that your photos have started to export. 
and if you open up your 360 parts folder you'll also see the photos starting to appear. This marks the point where we're now ready to piece the parts of the 360 puzzle together in ice. Now that we've got the repetitive stuff out of the way, let's move on to the more rewarding aspect of actually creating the 360 from all the composite photos you've just developed in Camera Raw. Now one might think that creating the 360 composite might actually be quite difficult, but ICE makes this process really streamlined and simple. Let's get stuck into it. We're going to start by opening up ICE and also opening up our 360 parts folder. We'll select all 24 of our photos, drag the photos over top of ICE and let go. Here you can see all 24 of your composites laid out and ready to be stitched into a 360 photo. You'll notice there's a couple of camera motion options available but otherwise ICE keeps it rather simple. The auto detect selection is the only camera motion we require for this edit so select that and click next. ICE will then start to generate your 360 degree from the 24 photos you've post-processed. This generally can take around about 30 seconds, maybe a minute, but generally ICE is pretty fast. Something I should note while the composite's stitching together, up top you'll see four tabs. This is the workflow of ICE. As I mentioned earlier, ICE keeps it fairly simple and streamlined. So you import the photos, you stitch them together, you crop the image, and then you export it out to a final image format. Now that the stitching is complete, we're in the stitch window and we can see our final image flattened out. You can adjust the image up and down in this area. You can also adjust left to right. This just allows you to make some minor adjustments to the horizon or where you'd like the image to be facing when you open it. Now you'll also notice on the right hand side is a selection of projections and you've got quite a large array of projections to select from. For this project we're going to select spherical. This will give us our full 360 degree panorama. As I zoom out, you will see the horizon the same across the entire image. It won't skew or distort your image. The setting will purely wrap your image around a spherical object to give us that 360 effect. Once you've selected the spherical projection, you won't need to do anything unless your horizon line slightly skewed, you may want to adjust it. Then we'll move on to click next. The image will then be projected as selected and you'll move on to the cropping tab where you can crop out any of the undeveloped areas. I find that on these types of 360 photos it's most likely you'll get a tinting effect along the top similar to what you can see on my screen at the moment. This is easy to fix because ICE has another wonderful feature where it can auto-complete these areas. Similar in a way to Photoshop, it will analyze the imagery around the areas that are not developed and fill them in with similar detail. You may get the occasional anomaly, but there's nothing to be concerned about here. You will be able to remove these anomalies from Photoshop. Ensure you have the Use Auto Completion box ticked, and then click Next to move to the export process. Here on the Export tab, you can see there is a number of features. Again, ICE keeps it really simple. There's not a lot you need to change here. We have got scale, we have got resolution. Um, you can also see the megapixels, which uh, is quite amazing for something that's just come off a drone. Uh, 146 in this case. We're going to select just a TIFF image, and we're going to export that to our preferred location, which in this case is the 360 finals folder. Thanks for watching, guys and girls. Stay tuned for the next video because we're now ready to pop over to Photoshop and polish up the sky as well as any rough edges on the 360 image.